coffee. I think everybody in America is drinking coffee at some point today, right? In my house particularly, we go through so much coffee. I'm like an avid coffee drinker. As a matter of fact, I just wrote on Facebook the other day, everybody tell me your favorite coffee that you drink. Did you know that coffee wasn't always America's first drink? As a matter of fact, people, they used to drink tea back when. People started drinking coffee around about 1773, but before then, everybody in America, you go to their home and they are drinking tea. They make you this type of tea, they make you that type of tea. It was a hot commodity. And if you own tea, if you had tea, it meant that you were somebody. Why is that so important to today? Because I really remember this story that happened in history. That there were these people who went and they took some things that really weren't theirs and they took them and they were trying to make a statement and they grabbed property that wasn't theirs and they took all this tea and they poured it into the Boston Harbor, right? And in the midst of pouring into the Boston Harbor, they were making a statement because they were like, we don't want the British to own us. We don't want the British to tax us, da, 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 all these different things. They poured the tea into the Boston Harbor. It kind of destroyed the Boston Harbor and made it unusable for so long, but they ended up getting their point across, which is saying, we are tired of what you're doing. And that tea, they didn't own that tea. They didn't own that harbor. It wasn't theirs to do it with. But they decided if I take something valuable that has a uh, matter to you and that's close to your heart and actually hits your pockets and I begin to destroy it, I'm not thinking about the fact that the river is unusable for years, that the farmers along the river, they can't use it, that the ports along the river are unusable. We are trying to make a statement. We're willing to go this far to prove that's a statement. When I hear that story, I'm torn because I don't know if I call those guys patriots or if I call them thugs and looters. They didn't own the tea. They destroyed the harbor and they made it unusable. And we call it the Boston Tea Party of 1773. I look at what's happening in Minneapolis right now. Am I condoning the rioting? Am I condoning what's happening? Absolutely not. What I am saying is let's slow down before we call them thugs and looters and ask ourselves a question. Is there an honest difference between rioting that we see now and moments like the Boston Tea Party, which make us America? There's a quote by Dr. King. He said this towards the end of his life. A riot is the language of the unheard. What made them respond that way with the Boston Tea Party of 1773? They felt unheard. If Dr. King is right and is the voice of the unheard, then as opposed to watching what's happening, maybe it's time for us to see with our ears. Maybe it's time for us to listen to conversations. Perhaps it's time for us to give people a seat inside of our homes and say, sit on my couch, tell me your experience. I'm not gonna deny it. I'm not gonna say it isn't true. I'm simply here to learn. My mom can remember Dr. King. I happen to remember Rodney King. Remember Rodney King, Los Angeles? His life and his experience actually led to this moment of rioting on the West Coast, other major cities. And he came out and made the statement can we all just get along? <laughs> we heard it, we felt it, we went along with it, later became a meme, later in living color ran with and other things, can we all just get along? And I think that's honestly what happens with all of us when it comes to topics that are touchy such as racism. It hits home for a moment, but we're so eager to get out of the tension 
that we're delighted to make it a meme. Oh yeah, you can make something a meme when it doesn't hit home. You can make something a meme when it doesn't affect your pockets. And you can make it a meme when it doesn't affect your home. I don't want to just get over it. I want to walk through it. It's important that we all decide about this. This moment has to matter to everyone. I think about something specific. When it comes to a topic like this, when it comes to a topic dealing with racism, the truth is that we aren't as committed as we should be. Racism, the conversation of it, is more thought of as a fashion statement, like a jacket that you put on. There are moments in the heat of things like this when it can be trendy, if you will, to talk about. Not saying that because you posted that is trendy. Don't belittle that moment of you posting because that post came directly from your heart. But if tackling racism is like a denim jacket that I put on because it matches the outfit of the moment and I treat it like a coat that goes in the climate that it's walking into, we will never end it. Tackling racism is more like work boots. You put them on, you don't take them off until the job ends. Sure, you may go home and get some rest, but you put them back on the next day. It cannot be a denim jacket. Many of us take our denim jacket of fighting for racism off because we feel like in order to wear the jacket for abortion, I have to take that one off. To wear the jacket for sex trafficking, I have to take it off. When the truth is that they all flow in concert with one another. We have to have a common dignity for one another. It can't just be a fashion statement. It has to be something that you stand on. I think about the Olympics. The Olympics come around, I'm so crazy about things like curling. I find myself waking up in the morning to watch curling. I post about curling. And then when the Olympics are over, I don't think about curling anymore. All I wanted to do was win. I just wanted America to win in curling. So I gave it my voice. I gave it my perspective. I gave it my attention. But I didn't give it my heart. I don't know one curling athlete. I don't know one team of curling. I don't even know how you get started in curling. All I know is sweep, 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 sweep. And then throw the little thing. And then when we win, I keep up with if we win. And if we medal, I keep up with that. Like you, I watched the video. Traumatic. Traumatic. Traumatic because it could be very simple for that to be me. Traumatic because it could, it could honestly be my brother. Traumatic because it could literally be you. I saw three people in the video. I saw the officer who had his neck on the guy. I saw Mr. Floyd on the ground. And I saw the additional officer standing to the right, standing there, really didn't have much expression, sometimes had his hands in his pocket. To me, there are those in America that are at the position of Mr. Floyd, being oppressed. And there are some in America that are at the position of the officer doing the oppression. Truth be told, many people are like the third officer, standing close enough to make a difference, having the credentials to make a difference, having the power and even the language to make a difference, but choosing to do nothing. He could have walked over and whispered into the other officer's ear and said, that's enough. 
He could have walked over and said, let's take him in. He could have stopped it. He could have gave voice to it. But instead, he sat silently, controlled the crowd with the silence. And a man died. Truth be told, at an innocent and honest place, how many times have you found yourself being that third cop? Or should I call him the additional cop? We can't anymore. If we're ever going to see our country change, if it's true that racism has to end, if it's true that God is not okay with racial injustice, and if we're going to stand up and make a difference, we have to walk through the tension of saying, I'm not going to be the cop who stands there. Because the truth is, is that it's bigger than it being a cop who stands there. Sometimes it's you who's standing there. I had someone tell me, what do I do? How can I help? That sounds like a fully loaded question in 2020. How can you help? Ask your African-American friends how they're doing. Ask them how you can lend your voice. Ask how you can lend your presence. But in order to join that conversation, it is not simply a pull up and sit on the couch and walk away. It is a commitment for a lifetime to walk hand in hand, step in step, arm in arm, heart to heart, story to story, experience to experience until we see things change. Other than that, the conversation is simply just a fashion statement. It took me days to figure out what I wanted to say. Why? Truthfully, I wasn't censored enough to be censored. I was afraid that I would say something that would antagonize the current conversation and narrative. I'm saying all of this to say, let's not assume Let's not assume that all the rioters are thugs when we call the people of the Boston Tea Party patriots. Let's ask the question that Dr. King started. What are they trying to say? What does the Bible say about moments like this? It's very emphatic. It's very clear. God stands up for injustice. If you can fight for abortion, if you can fight for sex trafficking, you have to fight against racism. I'm asking you, don't just lend your post, lend your posture, lend your position. And if it comes to it, lend your pockets. Are you willing to give? Are you willing to position yourself? It's muddy, it's ugly, because racism challenges every aspect of our system and every aspect of who we are and even the generation that we come from. But if you're willing to do it, you can make a difference. People started drinking coffee in 1773 because they said to drink tea was unpatriotic. And then tea made a comeback later on because somebody reestablished the name of the tea. Are you willing to give your brothers and sisters who don't look like you a second chance to possibly be the tea and to come back around and to make a comeback? We have to end racism. It starts with you. It doesn't start with your neighbor. It starts with you. For some, this will be tough to hear. It doesn't even start with the minority. It starts with the majority. Don't just give your post.
give you a posture, give you a position, and if you have to, lend your pockets. We're going to change it, but we have to change first.